To give or not to give? So it sounds like something out of a Shakespearean story, doesn't it? Um, okay, so before we start, a quick disclosure. Um, I do have funding from the NIH looking at, uh, to do research looking at postpartum hemorrhage. But my disclaimer is that none of the research that I do involves uh, fibrinogen concentrate nor tranescamic acid. So hopefully the information you're about to hear is unconflicted. So what we're going to aim to do over the next 25 minutes or so is initially look briefly at some of the epidemiology for postpartum hemorrhage, and then we're going to discuss some physiology. So what we'll do is we'll discuss the physiology related to fibrinogen and clot lysis during normal pregnancy for a normal delivery, and then for women who have excessive bleeding. Because hopefully that will give us a framework to determine whether there's a good indication to give fibrinogen concentrate or tranescamic acid in the setting of severe PPH. And then for each of these drugs, we'll look at some studies to see whether there's any evidence of efficacy for either of these drugs in terms of improving outcomes or reducing blood loss. All right, so let's start with the so what question. Why are we even thinking about using fibrinogen concentrate or tranescamic acid in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage? Well, I think we all know the answer to this question. Obviously, PPH is a major cause of maternal death and morbidity in the world and also in the US. But perhaps less commonly known is the fact that rates of postpartum hemorrhage have been steadily increasing in the US. So this is data from the CDC published by Bill Callahan and colleagues. And you have the rates of PPH on the y-axis and year of delivery on the x-axis going from the mid-90s all the way through to the mid-2000s. And if you look at the top line, what we're seeing is a slow but steady increase overall in the rate of PPH. The middle line is the rate of PPH due to uterine atony. You can see this rate slowly but steadily going up as well. The bottom line is the rate of PPH due to causes other than atony, which have remained fairly static over this period. So what this suggests is that atony is the main driver. It's not clear as to why, and that's probably a question that will be answered in a different lecture. But for us, obviously, if rates of postpartum hemorrhage are going up, then that means we're dealing with this problem more commonly, and therefore it's good for us to think about ways we can optimize care and treatment for these patients that have problems with bleeding after delivery. So why think about fibrinogen concentrate and trianoscamic acid? Well, really to figure out why, we need to know what these drugs are and how they work, and also some background. Because we can't just give these drugs blindly, assuming that they're a good idea and that they make sense. And as Shakespeare himself once said, ignorance is the curse of God, knowledge is the wing wherewith we fly to heaven. So let's find out some of the information about the physiology and pathophysiology, because maybe that gives us a good idea about whether we should be even thinking about these drugs from a clinical standpoint. So we'll look at fibrinogen concentrate first, and then we'll initially look at the role of fibrinogen in terms of clot formation. Then we'll look at the fibrinogen levels and how they may change during normal pregnancy in the setting of PPH. And then finally, we'll look to see whether fibrinogen concentrate uh, has any evidence to show that there's a good, um, it's a good treatment modality. So what's the role of fibrinogen, and is it important? Well, it is important. It's a very key component in terms of clot formation. How is it formed? Well, what happens to it after it's formed? It's converted from fibrinogen to soluble fibrin monomers in the presence of thrombin. And then when these monomers are formed in the presence of factor 13, they form a very strong lattice-like network or mesh over the area of vessel injury or tissue damage. The other important role of fibrinogen is that it helps bind platelets together. So it binds platelets using uh, receptors at the surface of the activated platelets called GP2B3A uh, receptor sites. And that basically forms a platelet plug to help en encourage and augment platelet aggregation at the site of injury. So with that in mind, what happens to fibrinogen levels during normal pregnancy and also during the course of a normal delivery? Well, I think we all know that pregnancy is associated with a high percoagulable state. As pregnancy advances, we see an increase in the uh, concentration of these fibrinogen levels. So we have data here on this graph from about five studies that have shown longitudinally over time that these fibrinogen levels increase from the first, second, all the way through to the third trimester. And if you look at the concentrations of fibrinogen in the third trimester, they're actually really high. So they're in the region of four, four and a half, maybe even higher than five grams per deciliter, or 500 milligrams, uh, four, four or five, or greater than five grams per liter, or 500 milligrams per deciliter if you're using the American units of measurement. So these are really high. They're much higher than what you're seeing in women that are of childbearing age that are non-pregnant. 
So bear that in mind when we start to look at the fibrinogen concentrations and levels in the setting of PPH. So let's look at the data on this. Do we know what happens to fibrinogen levels during uh, the setting of PPH? And is there any relationship between these levels and the severity of blood loss? Well, one of the first studies that looked at this came out by, uh, in, uh, by a group in France, spearheaded by Charbet and colleagues, and this is pretty seminal work. So what they did is they measured fibrinogen levels during the early phase of bleeding in women that had evidence of atonic postpartum hemorrhage. And they then went on to see whether patients developed severe PPH or not. And what they found was that if you measure the fibrinogen level early, the levels are significantly lower in the women that have severe PPH versus those that do not. What do we mean by low or significantly lower? So you can see here that in the severe PPH group, the concentrations are around two, two and a half, maybe three grams per liter. So this is low for someone who is pregnant. Now historically, if you looked at the anesthesia textbooks, they may have told you or recommended that you give fibrinogen supplementation if there's a concentration that's less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. That really doesn't fly in the setting of pregnancy, where we know you're starting off at a very high baseline, and so when you're thinking about someone who's bleeding, the levels of two or two and a half were actually quite low by comparison. When you look at the women who have fibrinogen levels measured that were two or less, all of those women went on to develop severe PPH. So what this initial study is telling us is that if you're measuring the fibrinogen level early and it's low, it's a red flag for someone being at risk or very high risk for going on to develop severe postpartum hemorrhage. There's been other studies that are observational studies that have corroborated these findings. If you look at the bar chart on the left, um, sorry, it's not a bar chart, it's a box and whisker plot. Uh, you can see here from a secondary analysis from a group in, in France, when again, when they measured the fibrinogen levels at the time of diagnosis of PPH, uh, there was a significantly lower level in women that went on to develop severe PPH versus those that did not. And in a second study from the UK, uh, in women that had severe PPH with a blood loss of 1,500 cc's or more, you can see here that there's an inverse relationship between the fibrinogen level, uh, and the, the nadir fibrinogen level, and the overall estimate for blood loss. So as the fibrinogen level decreases, there's a nonlinear re relationship with an increase in the overall estimate for blood loss. All right, so knowing that there's evidence of a good association between the fibrinogen level and the severity of blood loss is one thing, but is there an influence or a contribution uh, with regard to fibrinogen causing more blood loss? And this is something that is less clear. But nonetheless, there's a lot of interest in using fibrinogen concentrate as a method to treat a low fibrinogen level if someone has severe postpartum hemorrhage. So what is fibrinogen concentrate? Well, it's plasma-derived, pooled, uh, and it's stored in a vial which is preservative-free as a lyophilized powder. Each vial contains around about one gram of fibrinogen. How do you prepare it? Well, you dilute it in 50 cc's of sterile water. And I emphasize the importance of this because we had an episode a few months ago where we wanted to give fibrinogen concentrate. We don't have, fibr uh, we don't have sterile water vials in our Pixis or Omnicell machines. So we asked one of the nurses to go and get us some vials. And they brought back some irrigation fluid probably not the best substance to dilute it in. So obviously bear that in mind because you may not have sterile water vials in your uh, drug dispensing machines. As you know, you give it IV. Uh, the manufacturer recommends that you don't exceed more than five cc's a minute, but there is some data from the cardiac literature suggesting that you may actually be able to give it a little more quickly than this. So let's cut to the chase. Does fibrinogen concentrate actually improve outcomes for women that have severe PPH? Does it reduce blood loss? Does it reduce the need for blood products? Does it reduce morbidity? And the problem is there really isn't an awful lot of data looking at outcomes in women that are exposed to fibrinogen concentrate versus, say, standard of care. Uh, the initial papers that came out suggested that there was evidence of improved hemostasis in women that had fibrinogen concentrate. And not surprisingly, uh, there was an evidence of uh, an increase in the maternal fibrinogen levels. That's great, but we really want to know whether outcomes are improved. So the only study that's been published thus far that's looked at this is, is this very interesting study published by a group in Scandinavia, um, Wickersloe, by Wickersloe and colleagues. So this came out in the British Journal uh, last year, and this is pretty interesting. What they did was they used fibrinogen concentrate, what they describe as preemptively. So patients were randomized to get either two grams of fibrinogen concentrate or placebo. 
Their primary outcome measure was whether patients got a red cell transfusion within six weeks of being given the studied drug. And as you can see on the slide, disappointingly, they didn't find a significant difference between those women that were exposed to fibrinogen concentrate and those women that had placebo. Around about a fifth of women in each group had or required a red cell transfusion during the study period. Now, there wasn't any evidence of venous thromboembolisms in either group, so there is some good news there. But most importantly, why didn't they find a difference between these two groups? And the answer seems to be that with the population they examined, no one really had, or very few women, really had evidence of severe PPH. The mean blood loss in each of these groups was less than 1,500 cc's. And what's more, there was a very low percentage of women who actually had a low fibrinogen level of less than two grams per litre at the time of study inclusion. So unfortunately, what, what we're seeing here is probably evidence that they're not really looking at the most applicable, the most clinically applicable population in terms of women that may truly benefit from fibrinogen supplementation with fibrinogen concentrate. If they looked at patients that may have had greater degrees of blood loss and who had a low fibrinogen level, it may be more interesting to see if there had been a better response. So is there any other data there to help guide us in terms of decision making? Well, there is one other study that came out in anesthesia last year. This is a, an impact study where uh, in a hospital in the UK, they used an MTP or what they call a shock pack, which had red cells, FFP, and platelets. And then they changed their protocol for managing PPH. So what they did was they still had the shock pack, but they used fibrinogen concentrate earlier on instead of FFP, and they used Rotem. So this is rotational thromboelastometry to help guide their decision making. It's never an easy word to say, is it? Um, so they then compared whether patients had, uh, were exposed to different numbers of blood products. And what they found was that in the um, modified protocol, that there was a lower number of units of blood products that were given uh, with Rotem guided care with fibrinogen concentrate compared to the historical shock pack approach. And there was a lower number of FFP units that were given, and a lower number of cryoreciprotate units that were given, and also a trend towards a lower number of units of um, red cells as well, but it wasn't significant. So there's some suggestion here that maybe there's a place for it, but bear in mind that they're using a very specific protocol that may not be generalizable to other institutions that are using a similar approach. So we really need more studies here to help determine whether there's true value in thinking about using fibrinogen concentrate. So what can we recommend? And this is probably the tough part because the recommendations are pretty much based upon personal opinion or expert opinion. So it may be reasonable to think about fibrinogen supplementation, possibly with fibrinogen concentrate, in patients that have severe blood loss where there's some lab evidence to show that the fibrinogen level is low. So certainly less than 200 and possibly less than 250. If you have Rotem and you're able to understand it, if you look at the fibrinogen com contribution to clot strength using the Fib10 parameter, if it's less than seven millimeters, then again, it might be worth thinking about supplementation with fibrinogen concentrate. If you don't have Rotem, you're using normal labs, and there's evidence clinically of coagulopathy, and you've already given FFP, and the blood loss is continuing, then maybe there's a place for fibrinogen supplementation in that respect. But we just don't know whether it's worth considering as empirical treatment in the absence of any results from the lab if there's evidence of moderate or severe blood loss. All right, so let's move on to tranescamic acid. And we're going to discuss clot lysis, excessive clot lysis, or hyperfibrin lysis, and then we'll examine the role potentially of tranescamic acid in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage. So cast your mind back to med school, nursing school, or your physiology books. So we've already talked about the fact that the fibrinogen level increases with, normally with pregnancy. What about clot lysis? How does that work? Well, when you get the fibrin monomers formed, and when they form the mesh, then the clot dissolves in the presence of plasmin. So it breaks down fibrin into fibrin degradation products, or FDPs. Where's, where does plasmin come from? Well, it's converted from plasminogen in the presence of plasminogen activators. So TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, or UPA, urokinase plasminogen activator. That conversion is also inhibited 
by specific inhibitors called plasminogen activator 1 and, as, and unorigin, unoriginally plasminogen activator 2, so PI1 or PI2. Uh, we see increases in plasminogen concentrations normally in pregnancy, but also we see uh, increases in uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 and also plasminogen activator inhibitor 2. So overall, we're not entirely sure whether fibrinolysis increases or not during the course of normal pregnancy. Uh, what about at delivery? Do we see an increase in clot lysis at delivery? And the answer is we think so, but it's not entirely clear. So there is some evidence to show that TPA concentrations increases transiently after delivery, and also there's evidence that one of the inhibitors, PI1, decreases as well during the early period after a normal delivery. But the data is pretty old, and the other issue here is that the studies haven't really standardized the measurement techniques that they've used to assess concentrations of these activators, of these activators and inhibitors. So we really need more studies here to give us a good idea about what's happening normally. So if that's the case, what about the potential role of tranescamic acid? Uh, and this is where it gets a little trickier. So before we look at the data on this, let's just remind ourselves about how tranescamic acid works. It binds to, reversibly, to plasmin and plasminogen at lysine binding sites. So it prevents the binding of fib fibrin uh, to these sites, and therefore it means that fibrin is less likely to be broken down. Okay, that's great. But is there a role for tranescamic acid in the setting of PPH? And this is where it gets even muddier. Now, physiologically, it's not clear whether there's excessive clot breakdown occurring in patients that have severe postpartum hemorrhage. There's some recent study uh, data suggesting that the plasmin concentrations don't really increase, increase in patients that have atonic postpartum hemorrhage. But there hasn't stopped a lot of investigators using tranescamic acid to try and either prevent or even treat postpartum hemorrhage. So there's a number of different studies that have looked at tranescamic acid for prophylaxis to see whether it can reduce blood loss after vaginal delivery and C-section. And there's a number of systematic reviews that have assessed the quality of those studies to determine overall whether it does reduce blood loss or not. Now, the issue here is that in pretty much or nearly all of these reviews, they've questioned the quality of these studies. Why have they questioned it? Well, there's been issues such as study drug allocation, issues about blinding, and no standardization within which, uh, uh, by which these studies have measured blood loss. So that's a real problem. And I need to be careful here because if you look at the country of origins for many of these studies, they're in less well-developed countries or in the developing world. So there may be issues here in terms of how they perform these studies compared to how they may be done in the US. So how, when, they look at the, when they looked at the data for these studies and each of these reviews, was there evidence of a reduction in blood loss? Well, the answer is yes, there was evidence statistically of a reduction in blood loss in the region of somewhere between 80 to 150 or 160 cc's of blood. Wow, is that a lot of blood loss or not? Well, I would question the clinical significance of using tranescamic acid for reducing blood loss for patients who have vaginal delivery or C-section if given prophylactically. What about if we're giving it therapeutically. Well, it gets even more tricky here because there are even fewer studies that have investigated it. This is the one that's probably attracted the greatest amount of attention by Anne-Sophie uh, de cloyd Buther and colleagues. So this is a group in France that performed a randomized study prospectively comparing a high loading dose, repeat high loading dose of tranescamic acid. So everyone received, if they were in the tranescamic acid group, four gram loading followed by a one gram per hour infusion versus placebo. So one of the concerns here is that this is an open-label, unblinded study, suggesting that there may be issues here with regard to investigator bias. Their primary outcome was blood loss between the time when they got the study drug and six hours afterwards. And what they found, again, was a modest reduction in the degree of blood loss. So those women who were exposed to tranescamic acid had a blood loss overall of around 170 cc's, compared to those that had placebo, where the blood loss was about 220. So again, even though statistically there's a reduction in blood loss here, we question whether there's, this is a clinically significant reduction overall. When you look at some of their secondary outcome measures, they found no evidence of a significant reduction in the incidence of transfusion between study drug administration and six hours afterwards, and no difference in the number of units of red cells that were given 
over the six hour period after PPH onset. So the best we can say is that there may be evidence of a modest reduction here, but we truly don't know and we need, we need more studies to look at this. So one of the studies that I think we're all really waiting for is this big juicy study, which is the women's study. This is a multi-center global study where women are being randomized if they have PPH after vaginal delivery or C-section to receive either one or two grams of tranescamic acid versus placebo. It's a big study because they're looking at 20,000 women overall. Now, from what I understand, the study should be done or should be close to being done by now. So everyone's waiting to see the results. Their main outcomes of interest are whether women had uh, death or hysterectomy. So they're pretty hard outcome measures. But one of the potential worries about this study is that they're not standardizing the way in which patients are receiving different types of treatment beyond getting either tranescamic acid or placebo. So we hope that they'll account for that somehow in their analysis. But either way, keep your eye on the literature because this study will certainly create uh, a lot of waves once the result comes out. So if we think tranescamic acid may not be that useful for patients that possibly have a tonic postpartum hemorrhage, are there any conditions where it may occur, where we, see, or where we see evidence of excessive clot breakdown? And the answer might be yes. So this is one example um, that was published by the Peter Collins group in the UK, where they used Rotem to detect evidence of excessive clot breakdown in a patient that had an AFE. So um, the conditions where we think we might see excessive clot breakdown include AFE, amniotic fluid embolism, uh, IUFD, intrauterine fetal death, uh, and possibly conditions where you're seeing severe DIC. How do they confirm excessive clot breakdown? Well, if you cast your eyes over to the top left um, graph, what you're seeing here is the XTEM component on Rotem. And you're seeing excessive clot breakdown happening extremely early compared to a normal trace. So it looks like a teardrop trace. I sometimes describe it as a snake that swallowed a Foley bulb. So hopefully that type of analogy may stick in your mind if you ever use Rotem in your institution and you see a trace like this. In this, uh, uh, in this um, case report that was published in Nigeria, mm -hmm. they gave tranescamic acid along with other uh, blood products. They saw resolution of clot breakdown and the patient did well afterwards. So it might be the case that if you can detect clot breakdown occurring excessively with Rotem or TEG, it may be a good idea for diagnostic purposes and also from a therapeutic standpoint. So what can we really take home with regard to tranescamic acid? And the answer is we don't really know at this point. We really need more studies to help us determine whether it's a good idea to consider uh, from a therapeutic standpoint or potentially from a prophylactic standpoint. It might be the case, therefore, if you've got patients that have evidence of excessive clot breakdown or hypofibrin lysis, that it's a worthwhile thing to consider. But if you don't have TEG or Rotem, potentially think about it for patients where you're seeing severe abruption, ARV, IUFD, or severe DIC. It's a lot of abbreviations, isn't it? Um, be wary about using it in very high doses. There's some um, suggestion from the French literature that if you're using four or six grams as a loading dose, uh, and the patient has severe PPH, they may be at increased risk of renal injury. And there's some suggestion from the cardiac literature, uh, although the incidence is probably very low, that uh, loading doses that are high with tranescamic acid may be linked to seizures. There's no suggestion of that, at least in the OB literature, but again, we just need more data here to confirm this. So in the meantime, if you are gonna consider using tranescamic acid, maybe think about a slightly lower loading dose of a gram, and think about another gram if there's evidence of ongoing bleeding. So what can we say overall? So the take homes are that uh, if you're dealing with someone where there's early suggestions of moderate or severe postpartum hemorrhage, it's a good idea to measure the fibrinogen early. If it's low, it's a real red flag for the patient being at high risk for developing severe PPH. In terms of fibrinogen concentrate, there's no suggestion, at least earlier on, if you give it preemptively, that it reduces the risk of transfusion. But we really need more studies to determine the true therapeutic effect and to evaluate the risk-benefit ratio. And similarly with tranescamic acid, prophylaxis may induce nothing more than a modest effect, but again, we need much more data here to help guide us to determine the efficacy from a therapeutic standpoint, as well as, as, well as to determine the risk-benefit ratio. So um, I thank you for your attention. Obviously, we'll be taking more questions at the end of the panel. Um, this is a picture of the Bay Bridge at night. So for the people that are coming out of town, it's really cool to see this. I know the weather's pretty inclement right now, but if you wander down to the Embarcadero, uh, the lights are pretty special uh, on a clear night anyway.
Okay, so thank you very much. And